Hello and welcome to the Spike Podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and joining me here in the studio, we have Spike's editor, Tom Slater. Hello. And I'm delighted to have down the line, uh, Inaya Falarin Iman, returning special guest to the show. Welcome. Hi. Coming up on the show today, Just Stop Oil, the US midterms, the pensioner imprisoned for selling mince pies and Matt Hancock's first few days in the jungle. So Just Stop Oil have been doing four days of consecutive protests on the M25 this week, causing huge amounts of disruption and chaos. And I, I mean, what do you make of this uh, group? Do you think they're um, angels out to save the planet or what, what's your take on it? I mean, it's just uh, so ironic in a dark way when we have an energy crisis, uh, partly uh, precip- precipitated by the fact that uh, Europe has been dependent on uh, Russia for for their energy supply for for decades, despite warnings from many different people, um, which has contributed to uh, energy prices being pushed up um, in relation to the, the Ukraine conflict and so on. And in light of that, we have uh, individuals and groups um, really advocating for policies that will only exacerbate that. I mean, it is frankly impossible if we just take them at their central demand to just stop oil coal and gas, uh, we would not have uh, a modern existence. We would not have um, all of the things <laughs> that, that, that support our, our life in the modern day. Um, and, and so they are totally out of touch, uh, really just ignorant of the reality of how the world goes round. And everything that they advocate for will take us backwards. Actually, uh, yes, we, we should care about the environment, at least in my view, and do things in order to, to protect uh, our long-term futures, but there's also other things that are massively harming people: poverty, uh, war, and conflict. And what they advocate for, um, I would say, is will only exacerbate those problems. Tom, one thing that Just Stop Oil people would say is that unless we do this, then we will have a kind of genocide. They do actually use this word mm. on their website. They say that you know it's going to kill children unless we stop expanding oil fields. What do you make of that kind of language? It's it's apocalyptic. I think, and that I think this week in particular, the uh, apocalyptic nature of their messages sort of really come to the fore. I think, yeah. especially with that twenty-four-year-old woman who was standing up on the gantries over the M25, uh, seemingly kind of holding back tears and saying, "I do not have a future." Mm. Um, and you see claims like this, and um, they use this as the just as their kind of all-purpose justification. It was yeah. like, well, of course we have to block roads. If, you know, if a few people can't get to their parents' funerals or get to the hospital in time to treat a stroke, so bad because of the this is a bigger issue. This mm. is a you know a mass extinction event potentially that's going to take place. Six billion um, people could die, as Roger Hallam, mm. Extinction Rebellion, used to be fond of saying. Exactly, which is no one actually believes that. What well, mm. the vast majority of people on the planet are going to die in this century. No one credible believes that. And the problem with it, first and foremost, is that it's not. True. Mm. I mean, what they're talking about, no one who has looked at any evidence would support what it is that they're saying. If anything, it's the inverse of the truth, because over the course of the past century, climate related deaths from climate related disasters have dropped by like 95%. Mm. Um, so, this idea that development, fueled in large part by fossil fuels, certainly, um, is actually making us more precarious. The inverse is true, because uh, nations have developed, that's because they, therefore they can protect themselves against the kind of uh, vicissitudes of, of nature mm. and so on and so forth. It's, it's those nations which are unfortunately underdeveloped, um, which are far more exposed to kind of climate related disasters and deaths and so on. So that's complete nonsense. The other thing about this kind of apocalyptic narrative is it's a debate ender. You can't yeah. talk about it. You know, you, you can't question their uh, motivations because, of course, there's this big loftier goal in place. I think the other thing which we're just starting to glimpse now is it's also very sort of anti human, really, mm. when you get down to it. It's this kind of idea that humanity is primarily the defiler of the earth, um, and that, again, we have to essentially be put in second place in order to looking after looking after the planet. And I think the more that that comes to the fore, people get an insight into how really extreme and creepy this ideology is, yeah. um, and also how ultimately anti-human it is. And I think that one of the things this week is it's, it's, uh, it's flushed out, I guess, just how extreme their particular worldview is. Because even up until now, there was a, a certain 
indulgence of them yeah as, you know their their cause is in the just, right place. they've got yeah. the right for you know they're on the right track or something mm-hmm. like that even if we don't like their tactics used mm-hmm. to be the kind of kind of message yeah i mean we should look at an example of the kind of creepiness that you're talking about this is a clip of uh, roger hallam founder of extinction rebellion and this is his message or advice to young people facing annihilation the other thing about social collapse is the complete loss of material security or law and order as you might say So what will happen is episodes where someone, a gang of young men, come into your house, they take your girlfriend, they take your mother, they put her onto the table and they gang rape you, her, in front of you. And then after that, they take a hot stick and they poke out your eyes and they blind you. That's the reality of the annihilation project that you face. So, Anaya, what do you make of that? You know, you're going to um, have to witness your family being um, sexually assaulted in front of you and you're going to have your eyes poked out because of um, climate change and um, rising CO2 levels in the atmosphere. What do, what do you make of that kind of uh, argument? Yeah, I mean, it, it would... There'd be a humorous element if it wasn't so uh, grotesque mm. and influential uh, to the public debate. I mean, these twisted... Uh, fantasies um, of someone that is frankly promoting a kind of death cult um, is really increasingly the dominant narrative that is being uh, adopted Mm. by many climate activists and young people. I mean, just a very quick anecdote. Very recently I was in speaking about uh, free speech, giving a talk on free speech at a school. And um, many of the kind of 16, 17, 18 year olds were, were we're saying that, you know, of course we need to censor uh, climate change deniers. Their speech is literally going to lead to the end of the world. It was, it, you know, young people are often, you know, quite frantic and absolutist in their view. But this, this kind of anxiety and panic and, you know, absolutist and um, exaggerated fear uh, about the future and all of the horrendous things can happen is really uh, having an influence and in shaping the, the, the minds of many young people. And I think even when we had COP, uh, you know, 27, you know, that's been, that's been going on. Yeah. Many of our politicians, uh, Rishi Sunak and, and Boris Johnson, have been very much uh, in maybe not the uh, same language, but advocating still very apocalyptic uh, uh, prospects for the future. And I think it just tells us that where we're at as a society, a very uh, pessimistic, even kind of nihilistic outlook that no longer... Uh, believes in the capacity of human beings to transform uh, the future and and, and make history. And that, you know, through ingenuity and innovation, we can uh, change the course of history. Now it's it's fear, it's a lack of human agency uh, and a very narrow uh, viewpoint of the future. Yeah, and and you're right to say that Hallam is just this sort of extreme end of the wedge. I mean, you brought up COP27 and Sunak and Johnson and, you know, Antonio Guterres is very striking, you know, his kind of language Mm -hmm. talking about we're on the highway to hell and we've got our foot on the accelerator. We're in in the fight for our lives and we're losing. Mm -hmm. This is is very much mainstream as well without the, you know, not quite as florid, of course, as Hallam. Yeah, and the last IPCC report dropped, that was red alert for humanity. Mm. That was how it was um, discussed, or at least that's how it was discussed by the politicians, not necessarily the scientists themselves. And I think and I hit the nail on the head insofar as this is really about a profound sort of discomfort with the whole human project. You see Mm. this with discussion about the Industrial Revolution, which has flared up again in in recent days, uh, around the whole kind of climate reparations thing. It's effectively bound up with the idea that the West um, and Britain, by kind of unleashing... Uh, this new era of modernity that Mm. we therefore have a debt to pay um, that we therefore have to make up for damages despite the fact that um, it goes to some of the points we were making earlier about how few people are actually dying as a result of the weather despite the fact that the human population has increased so much over the course of the past century we're going to hit 8 billion people next week according to the UN exactly which is you know for the environmentalists and the kind of anti-humans of their day would have been unthinkable that Mm. we could have actually produced enough to um, look after that many people on this planet um, the Industrial Revolution is essentially the best thing that ever happened to humanity. Yeah. You know, it's not to say that it's the high point of all human civilization, but if you look at anything in terms of how long people live, the quality of their lives, um, the amount of people that were able to sustain, it was this enormous boon for humanity. Um, and what I think is so striking is that people, including these climate protesters, who see themselves as sort of radical, left-wing, whatever, uh, rather than wanting to build on that, 
they want to unpick it. You know, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about how um, Greta Thunberg has outed herself as anti-capitalist because of mm. some comments she recently made or that this is essentially, you know, the watermelon that's green on the outside and red on the inside, whatever. It's not so much these people are anti-capitalists. Um, it's that they're sort of neo-feudalists. They yeah. want us to go backwards. And that ideology is not only something which would genuinely come at a huge cost to humankind, it's also just fundamentally misanthropic. It sees us as the problem, mm. whether they want to admit it or not. And I think so much of this, and particularly the mainstreaming of it, as you were saying at COP or elsewhere amongst the elites, does just demonstrate that this isn't just a case of a handful of protesters who have, at this point, kind of lost any potential purchase with the public. The unfortunate thing is that they're all sort of Roger Hallam now, <laughs> in one way, <laughs> shape or another, and that's going to be a much trickier thing to dislodge as we go forward. Did you know that learning has been shown to improve our mood? And with the brilliant shows, documentaries and series available on Wondrium, learning doesn't have to be something formal, like enrolling in a course or studying. Learning can be on our own terms and fun. I know I always feel great after learning something new, and on Wondrium, it's just so easy. Wondrium is the educational platform that helps us all become better versions of ourselves. For instance, I've always been fascinated by Iceland, and that's why I've been watching The Great Tours Iceland on Wondrium. Did you know that Iceland is home to the world's oldest parliament, and its natural history is fascinating too? Iceland was born from ocean volcanoes that erupted 25 million years ago, and which still shape its landscape today. This 24-part series shows all the wild, natural beauty of this amazing place. After watching that, I can't wait to visit. This show is just one of the many brilliant series available on Wondrium. Wondrium has unlimited access to thousands of hours of content covering any topic you can imagine. This includes audio and video courses, documentaries, tutorials, and much more. All of this is presented by top professors and experts, but there's none of the pressure of homework or grades. I know you're going to love Wondrium too, and so I want you to sign up today. Wondrium is offering spiked podcast listeners and viewers 50% off your first three months. That's half off when you sign up for your first quarterly plan. It's a fantastic deal. To get this offer, you need to visit our special URL, wondrium.com slash spiked. Again, that's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash spiked. Okay, so let's move on to talk about the US midterms. Um, a lot of politicos and commentators and, and even the polls, I think, were pointing towards a possible red wave, a big shellacking for the Democrats and the you know Republicans being resurgent. This hasn't quite happened. The Republicans have taken the House, but they've underperformed significantly um, they're what they expected, certainly. Tom, what, what have you made of this kind of result? Well, I think it shows, in many respects, just the sort of limits of the sort of desiccated remains of Trumpism, mm. um, to be perfectly honest. I think there is a clear indication, although some, you know, there's a lot of results that are still to come in. We don't really even know if, uh, to what degree the Republicans are going to take the House, although it seems more or less nailed on at this point. going to be much more modest, as you were saying. Sort of a dead heat with the, the Senate. It could go either way, but very fine margins. But what you can see is there's a lot of kind of Trumpist candidates, whether we're talking about Dr. Oz yeah. in Pennsylvania or whether we're talking about Herschel Walker in Georgia, who is still kind of in the running, but at the same time, it's a pretty, you know, it's a pretty close race. It looks like it's going to go to a runoff. Mm. Um is the fact that they have either underperformed or, or failed in many respects. Not all of them, but uh, many of them. And I think it does feel as if that kind of iteration of Republican politics has sort of run its course because it got so mired yeah. in what in many respects was the complete opposite of what made it powerful in the first place, which is that it had this kind of populist democratic instinct. But of mm. course, ever since 2020, it's got mired in this, all these conspiracy theories that um, American democracy is a sham and that the only reason Donald Trump lost was because of voting machines made in Venezuela or yeah. so on and so forth. I mean, there's various different theories floating around, but that's essentially where we're at. So I think there's a kind of sense in which um, – and also, to be honest, like a lot of the lunatics who were selected to, to – to take part in these races who believed a lot of this nonsense and were just quite strange individuals anyway. The idea that all Trump has to do, that he kind of is just the puppet master and as yeah. long as a candidate kisses his ring, then he's going to be delivered some sort of overwhelming victory. I should say it's definitely not a vindication of the Democrats. Joe Biden remains very unpopular. Yeah. There is a, a huge restiveness and um, backlash to the way in which you want to talk about everything from the economy to crime to the pushing of 
you know, woke values in schools and education institutions. There's a, there's a huge pushback to that. Um, and I think in the figure of Ron DeSantis, which I'm sure we'll get into, you kind of see how that's still quite powerful in certain places. Um, it's still the fact that the sort of, whilst populism lives on, Trumpism yeah. has really kind of screeched to a halt in many respects because as, we, as I was saying, it got so mired in a lot of bullshit, yeah. really. And I, I mean, some of the things Tom's were, Tom was laying out there, is, especially in terms of the Democrats, in terms of, um, you know, what Biden um, has achieved or not achieved, you know, soaring crime, soaring inflation, um, their general kind of haughtiness. It does feel like it probably should have been on the Republicans' plate, and yet still they've kind of fallen short. Mm. No, I think it really reveals problems that are quite similar on both sides of the Atlantic. You know, you have a population that um, in many different ways over the last kind of five years or so tried to express themselves democratically um, to demand a, a transformation of, of the way that politics is done and and making sure that uh, the economic situation genuinely works to the benefit of, of you know, ordinary citizens. And on the one hand, you know, unfortunately, many of the promises of the kind of populist leaders um, either were completely squandered um, by a backlash uh, from, from the establishment or, or the, the candidates that um, that led with those arguments uh, could not rise to the challenges and actually came with a whole host of uh, problems and, and shortcomings of their own. Um, so, you know, many people have listed the, the shortcomings of Trump, to say the least, but to have <laughs> a, a, a political figure promote uh, such uh, absurd conspiracy theories and um, uh, such a hostility to institutions and so on, you know, it, it is never going to really uh, bring the kind of positive democratic change that people want. But on the other hand, again, similarly in the UK, the, the alternative is is a, a very uh, if technocratic managerial, and if not that, you know, a, a centre left or left that doesn't seem to have um, the ideas, the passion, uh, the respect for, for for ordinary citizens. Also, so you, you have this politics where no no side either um, really can claim victory and, and, and nothing uh, really changes. And so it it really is a big question now that how do uh, ordinary people um, express themselves democratically uh, when the options that they have um, are, seem so limited? And, you know, people have floated other uh, Republican candidates like DeSantis and so on, but I do think that the, the problems that we um, have in politics is, is much deeper and is going to take much more kind of thinking and, and, and a radical response. Yeah, Tom, bearing that in mind that obviously there's no one candidate or person who's going to get us out of this trouble, that we, we should talk a little bit about DeSantis just because he was a sort of rare yeah. bright spot for the Republicans, um, you know, kind of proven winner in that sense, um, in that very limited sense, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, what have you made of his campaign and mm. his his rise? No, no, it's very decisive. It's worth remembering that back when he first um, sent it to the, the governor's mansion back in 2018, he scraped it by like, yeah. you know, a fraction of a percent. Um, and so it was by no means kind of nailed on. I mean, the thing about Florida is it's famously like, the, you know, the, the swing state of all swing states, you know, it's a very purple state. And yet this time around, um, he has been re-elected resoundingly. I mean, he's got mm. approaching a kind of 20 point lead last time I checked. Um, and has also been seen to, in the period that he's he's been in office, um, to have chalked up a kind of series of very significant wins around sort of defying the orthodoxy in relation to COVID in taking on the culture war very forcefully um, in essentially even the immigration issue, which has obviously flared up more recently as well. And whilst, you know, we could criticise particular policies that he's pursued or the points it might tip mm. into something that feels slightly more sort of illiberal, it's quite clear that that's part of what is resonating. And it's also resonating with the sections of society that were quite decisive or interesting components of the Trump coalition. Mm. Um, so I think, he again, he had something like a double-digit poll lead amongst Hispanics in Florida, very, very decisive for him. He won the Miami-Dade region, which is, again, historically very democratic. You could see the um, sharp intake of breath on the... Mm. You know, watching CNN when the pundits revealed the, mm -hmm. the, him taking that, it was, it was quite striking. A, a, a lot of shock about it. I think one of the things, uh, you know, again, it's, we don't want to be in a position where, or, and, you know, it's, it, it's 
it's a fragile situation where any particular party is just looking for kind of one person to save the day. It usually yeah. means that something has gone a little bit wrong. But um, it does feel like there are certain um, components there. I think one thing that he does, which is... Um, potentially worth looking at is that it's that marriage of some of the populist energy but also with a sense of delivery mm. i mean one thing that happened with trump was the fact that in a way he was a bit like the dog that caught the car like he didn't really know what to do with it once he actually yeah. got it was slightly surprised and in that empty vessel got poured a lot of just standard republican ideology you know mm. a sort of paul ryan tax cut what have you uh, and also, naturally, because of the backlash from the establishment and this attempt to sort of expel him like he was this virus meant that he spent um, a lot of his time just kind of defending his own legitimacy, yeah. effectively. And you know, obviously that then became almost self-propelling and whatever, yeah. and it all gets mired in the election result, which just became a complete and utter circus. But still, um, what you're seeing is a kind of sense of, well, we can vote for these people, but what happens? Yeah. What do we get out of it? We want our lives to get better. We want mm. to push back against these things in society we don't like. I think what on, on the sort of statewide level and with the powers that he has, DeSantis is able to have that sort of record, if you like, that kind of um, that mixture of actually doing something with the yeah. power that you're sort of lent. Um, it's not to say that it's a... Uh, this is the kind of like, you know, the the, form, the absolute winning formula, who knows what's going to happen. But I think his success is there in a state that was, now feels very deep red, despite the fact it was considered a purple state for so long, tells you something yeah. about what's resonating in that part of the world. And before we move on, it would be remiss not to notice that this was the most important midterms ever. And literally democracy is was going to be on the line. And if you didn't vote for the Democrats, then... Um, mm. There was going to be hell to pay because the Republicans are semi-fascist. There was going to be violence at the polls, Joe Biden warned. I mean, uh, <laughs> and I, what, what have you made of that kind of um, sort of rhetoric that this is uh, perhaps democracy has been saved now that the Democrats have done OK? Maybe maybe that's why we've sort of woken up and are not um, quivering in our beds. Yeah, I mean, it just makes you wonder, like, you know, how, how can we have a, a reasonable, considered uh, political debate about the problems that America is facing and 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 what we can you know do democratically to resolve them when every uh, every issue is kind of framed in this hugely dramatic existential uh, way where you're kind of that the victory for your political opponents will will literally be the the end of of democracy in America as we know it fascism that, or that communism in or many ways can can lead to a kind of dehumanizing view. Um, uh, and such a polarised view of, of people that disagree with you. And I think, yeah, it's just, you know, yet another uh, example of just how the debate, unfortunately, about American politics so often is is just mm. uh, marred by these exaggerations and absurdities. It is, it is worth stressing as well, because there's been a lot of talk, I'm sure everyone's um, noticed it, about like the democracy deniers. That's yeah. the kind of phrase used to refer to the sort of Trumpist candidates who buy the stop the steal stuff, or at least mm. even if they don't buy it, are pursuing it for perceived electoral gain. Um, but it is worth reminding people that the sort of the far more sophisticated democracy deniers are on mm. the democratic side. You know, there was this, there's this fascinating status, something like 72% of democratic voters, because and not least because this is a view very much supported by the democratic establishment, still think that 2016 was basically fishy. Yeah. You know, that um, if 2020 wasn't stolen, then 2016 certainly was. And you've got figures like Stacey Abrams, you know, who was um, running in the gubernatorial race down in Georgia for a second time against Brian Kemp who never conceded from the 2018 result, yeah. actually used the phrase, this election was stolen, um, mm. claiming that because of what she saw as measures which effectively suppressed the vote meant that um, she wasn't handed the key. She continued to say, we won, yeah. over and over again. So that sense, that space for kind of loser's consent yeah. and all the rest of it, the febrileness of politics is still very much there and you just need a sort of... Yeah, the, the means to kind of get past that into something resembling a sort of proper democratic contest is important because if you've got both sides essentially saying that um, we're going to lose our country unless you vote <laughs> for us, then that is almost the that's not a proper democratic choice. You're not mm. talking about pursuing a different vision. You, it's competing politics of fear, yeah. really. And I think particularly the kind of populist energy in politics needs to be far more democratic and hopeful and positive can't just be about trying to scare them witless about some alleged, you know, terrifying takeover. Everybody likes to have goals, and it feels great when you actually manage to pull them off. For me, picking up a language is one of my favourite things to aim at, and nothing could be simpler and more fun than learning a language with Babbel. Did you know that Babbel's bite-sized 15-minute lessons are designed to be the most efficient and effective way to learn a new language? 
And Babbel has you covered for all the most popular languages. It's got courses in 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. By focusing on natural conversation, Babbel makes learning a language quick and easy. Because Babbel's interactive lessons aren't just robots talking on. They're voiced by native speakers using a method based around everyday speech. That means Babbel will have you speaking confidently about real-life topics in absolutely no time. Plus, there are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to the lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, or even live classes with a language teacher. So start your language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, Babbel is offering our listeners six months for free with the purchase of a six-month subscription with the promo code SPIKED. Go to babbel.com slash play and use the promo code SPIKED for an extra six months for free. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com forward slash play with the promo code SPIKED. Babbel, language learning that works. So let's talk about the pensioner who was um, sentenced to six months in prison today for perverting the course of justice because he covered up or tried to cover up the fact that he had been selling mince pies and wine in lockdown from his um, shooting club. And I, what have you what have you made of this? I mean, it's it's striking still that people are still being punished for kind of lockdown breaches, essentially, even if it's just sort of only sort of tangentially related. Um, we lost our minds in that period, didn't we? I think it's fair to say. Yeah, and I mean, on, on that specific story, you know, there are complexities there, but I do think um, it is really uh, disconcerting and, and worrying that. Um, nearly you know three years or be three years in, in a few months really since we went into lockdown we have failed to have a honest um and frank conversation about what happened uh what went wrong and many of the uh issues that we're talking about right now in relation to interest rates and inflation and um the cost of living crisis uh and the way that inequality within society has been both entrenched and, and further exacerbated are are directly in some of those instances a consequence of the policies that we we took um, in 2020 and afterwards. And just continuing on that, the way that um, many pre-existing social trends were, were accelerated um, around censorship, uh, around uh, the kind of way in which all people were kind of disconnected from one another and increasingly suspicious of one another and the kind of medicalization of public life. And, and it is, you know, sad, but unsurprising that this is just yet another example of how um, the consequences of that um, are, are still being played out. And nobody wants to be honest about that. It's completely absurd. When we had all of the controversy around uh, politics and, and politicians around cakes and so on that normal people, ordinary people, um, are still being uh, punished. Um, so I think a good thing that could have been done after all of the cake controversy is that all of the people that uh, were charged with lockdown fines and so on should have got an, an amnesty or if not had that money refunded. Um, so I think it is just deeply, um, deeply sad that this is happening, but just an example of how we're still not really confronting truthfully uh, the, the craziness really that was the lockdown policies mm -hmm. and all of the things around it. Yeah, Tom, I mean, it's, you know, it, liberty feels like the thing that's often missing from this discussion. Yeah. If you see what I mean, there are news stories every day about the kind of health consequences of lockdown, mm -hmm. you know, the BB, even the BBC talking about the um, record rate waits to have um, to see a cancer doctor and things like that. Mm -hmm. The A&E times have ballooned. Um, the economy is obviously discussed a lot in relation to lockdown, but but liberty has been the thing that's not been reckoned with even slightly, it feels like. No, no, I think that's exactly right. I think that um, period in the beginning of the pandemic when effectively the, our whole sort of liberal tradition was turned on its head mm. and that you were only able, able to do things, if, you know, you were only uh, able to do things if the government effectively said that you were allowed to. If Matt Hancock you know, said you were allowed yeah, to. Yeah, which, if, you know, as we'll get on to, is a, is a strange... <laughs> it's like people always say about, you know, freedom, you know, who decides what I should be allowed to do? You know, yeah. And for some reason that person was Matt Hancock mm. uh, for a long period of time. I mean, he was making and unmaking laws at the strike of a pen. We know all about this. And also just the punitiveness, you know, the £10,000 fines 
for yeah. having a relatively modest amount of people around your house, um, scrambling drones over the Peak District because people were <laughs> walking their dogs. And also this kind of thing, it became almost unchecked by even what the letter of the law actually was. I mean, the police yeah. had no idea what they were doing. They just felt like they had right on their side. And as we've seen in recent years across other issues, they were just, um, when they felt like they were doing good, they were being incredibly authoritarian and being applauded in doing so. There was an alarming amount of people who were snitching on their neighbours and who were essentially kind of, again, sort of co-opted into that climate of extreme th fear and authoritarianism. Um, but there's very little reckoning with that. I mean, an amnesty is nice. It would be a great place to start, but a kind of recognition that we cannot ever be in a situation in which you eff effectively can have your liberty stripped from you for an indefinite period. Yeah. Laws of the land made with barely any democratic scrutiny um, at a whim mm. and in a moment of panic. And surely that's something that we've got to get past for whatever crises might face us in the future. Let's move on to talk about Matt Hancock's new uh, career move. Um, he is now officially in the, in the jungle. Um, he's been singing some Ed Sheeran and he's been subjected to some gruesome uh, Bush Tucker trials. Um, Thomas, it's sort of just punishment for Hancock, making him eat kangaroo cock or whatever is going to be inflicted on him in the next few days. We haven't got to the kangaroo cock yet, but I'm no. sure it's only a matter of time. <laughs> the nation's waiting. I, this might um, be a bit unpopular, I struggle to get too angry at Matt Hancock because I think he's a ridiculous <laughs> figure. Yeah. Um, and obviously he has um, an awful lot to answer for in relation to uh, the lockdown policy, in relation to the care homes crisis, his ineptitude in relation mm. to dealing with that particular issue. Um, he didn't even know, as far as I remember, about the fact that people were being discharged from hospital into care homes without having to have a negative test that had to be kind of raised with him before it was actually tackled. And all of that is deadly, deadly serious. I think the, the, the difficulty is, is the fact that he's so ridiculous. Yeah. Um, he's so embarrassing. He's so sort of cringe. He's, that it, it, it's difficult to sort of beat up on him in a sense, if you see what I mean. Um, and it's something where he's, you know, he's going into the jungle already terribly unpopular. Yeah. Um, he's going in there not having, already having humiliated himself, not least through that lockdown breaky affair that effectively ended his top level political career. And I think mm. aside from anything else, just sort of a reminder of what complete weirdos and pygmies our political system <laughs> had thrown up. And then they're confronted with something like a pandemic. And not only do they make terrible deadly blunders, but also they humiliate themselves in yeah. another sort of way, despite the fact that his pedigree is impeccable. You know, PPE, yep. um, economist at the Bank of England, you know, really climbed his way up the greasy Advisor pole. Advisor to George Osborne. He's like the great genius of our age, as some people are to be um, believed. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, this is the best that we could produce, was this <laughs> idiot who doesn't seem to realise that he's going to make himself even more of a laughing stock by going on this TV show. So maybe I'm talking myself into getting angry at him, but still it's hard to. <laughs> and are you excited to see... Hancock climb even lower than we even thought possible? God, I mean, nothing says adult in the room uh, are back than I'm a celebrity. I mean, it's, just, <laughs> it's just a bit... <laughs> it's just a bit em embarrassing, to say the least. I'm, I, I, It just shows just the complete degradation of our political class. As Tom said, uh, the former health secretary that, was, that oversaw one of the most uh, biggest and consequential decisions in, in public health that perhaps, you know, we've ever seen or at least seen for a very long time um, could even really rationalise that this was a good, this is a good decision to go on. Uh, I'm a celebrity. I mean, it makes a complete mockery um, of, of public office. And I'm not one to kind of talk about, uh, you know, pu public office in that way. But I do think, you know, is there anything, uh, you know, noble about it? Is there anything uh, about public duty that you should at least attempt to hold yourself to, um, you know, better standards than doing the kinds of behaviours that uh, uh, Matt Hancock is going to be engaging in um, for, for all of our te TV screens for the next uh, few weeks? It's just really embarrassing. And it is the way that politicians, you know, attempt to use these shows uh, as a way to rehabilitate their reputation. I mean, some of them seem to successfully do it. Um, yeah, Ed Ball seemed uh, to do it quite well. And, you know, Ad, Ad Woodicum is, is, you know, a genuinely big character and hilarious. But, you know, you've got Matt Hancock, who has the personality of a shoe, <laughs> um, you know, just very little charisma, um, attempting to do it. I, I, I just think, you know, good, good luck to him. But, uh, I, I think it's a very sad state of affairs for our politics. 
Thank you so much for watching the Spikes podcast. We'll be back next Friday. If you hit subscribe and click the bell, you'll never miss an episode. And in the meantime, why not check out all of Spike's other videos and podcasts on this channel? And for more Spiked content, find us at spiked-online.com.